Patria has been very, very generous with her time over the years with Georgia Tech. Uh, she has done uh, numerous office hours and has um, been really great volunteering her time and mentoring uh, a lot of Georgia Tech startups. Um, Patria is a partner in the PAPSTA patent group, uh, where for over three decades she has provided IP counsel uh, in the areas of biotechnology, medical, pharmaceutical, and uh, in chemical fields. She received her BA in biology from UT Austin. She has an MS in biology from UT San Antonio and a JD from Suffolk University. Um, today, uh, Patria is gonna be talking about IP strategy basics for startups. So um, Patria, I'm handing it over, the mic over to you. Thank, Thank you so much, much uh, for joining us, for, for speaking to us today. Thank you, I always love these opportunities to talk with people. Um, what I've done is I've put together a talk today that's based on primarily experience in the field, which has changed dramatically when I, from when I first got involved. I actually started back in the 80s in Boston, where we just had biotechnology started, uh, started right after the discovery of restriction enzymes in 1977. And there was a plethora of startups and universities really didn't have technology transfer at the time. It was early, early stage. I got involved because I was at a law firm and the partner there played golf with Art Smith, who was the technology licensing office at MIT. And so it was really early stage. People were doing startups based on the traditional business models, which of course, resulted in a lot of disastrous failures. They, they didn't work. And that has evolved over time to where now it's a very standard thing to consider. Should we, do we have anything protectable? Should we protect it? Is it marketable? Do we license? Do we do a startup? If we did, could it succeed? So, and, and I'd like to say that that's well developed at this point, but it is still in flux. It continues to develop and there are new opportunities, but it's, it's a much more consumer friendly environment now than it used to be. Next, I have, I have uh, Christy Burroughs is being kind enough to move the slides for me. So let me talk a little bit about intellectual property. I think most people here know the purpose of intellectual property is to exclude competition. It's to increase the value of what you have by excluding competitors in the market. So the first thing you have to have is a market. It does not matter if you have something that is protectable if there is no market. Valuation turns on the size of the market and the market can change over the time. Next. The most important questions we start out by asking are, what is it? Is it protectable? How can I protect it? Is there a market? And that turns on a couple of things. Do you have a product that's marketable uh, or just an idea? Um, is there a need for that market? Is that market going to last for a period of time? Do you have freedom to oper operate? Um, do you have the resources to develop the market? Is it something you're gonna have to partner with somebody? I recently was working with a group out of um, MIT and, and a hospital in Boston where they developed a computer program uh, to take and modify off-the-shelf graphs for treating aneurysms where they wanted to make it patient-specific. And what was cur is currently done is basically a doctor looks at a bunch of, of images and then burns a hole in this graph and that's what they use. So they created this really fabulous computer program. The problem is computer programs are not very patentable and they tend to change over time as they make improvements. So when you say, what is it? Well, yeah, it was a computer program. Is it protectable? Well, sort of, hard to protect. Is there a market? Absolutely, currently in clinical trials. So the question then was, how could we convert this to something that was more protectable? And what I did was I looked at it, I said, well, this is really a method, isn't it? And they said, yeah, it's a method that uses algorithms. I said, oh, algorithms, not patentable subject matter. So can we translate it into text and figures? And the answer was yes. So that was the approach we took. So just because something superficially may look like it's not protectable does not mean it's not. Uh, there are ways to do this. Similarly, sometimes you have a, a great idea 
and you say, is it protectable? And is there a market? And the answer is, I don't think you can protect it, but there's a huge market. I always look at the example of the plastic water bottle. Every one of us buys bottled water. It's a huge market, low profit margin, huge market. But the first thing you'd say is, no, it's not protectable. And the answer is, yes, it is. It's been protected with trademarks. It's been protected with design patents. It's been protected with methods of filling, methods of sterilizing, sourcing the water, um, additives now, flavorings and so forth. So yeah, it is protectable. But they built a huge market out of something that you wouldn't have thought was ever something protectable. And it always reminds me of the, the famous quote from P.T. Barnum, there's a sucker born every minute. So instead of walking to a, a uh, faucet and putting water in it, you go buy a bottle of water. So, you know, there is a need most of the time. If you're able to identify it, say, how can I protect it? How can I expand this out? Sometimes markets are limited in duration. If we look at what's happened over the last year and a half with COVID, you realize that there's been a huge amount of effort to create vaccines for COVID to push the marketing, the distribution, the regulatory approval and get a product out there. The likelihood is that market's going to crash completely in a couple of years. Is there always going to be a need? Probably, but not like it is now. The valuation's going to go down probably fairly significantly in a short period of time. One of the reasons they push so hard. So, you know, these are the kind of things that you look at in determining what is it, how is it protectable, what kind of a market do we have. Next. So when I'm looking at these kinds of things, I, I decided it was most useful to start with a decision tree. So we have technology, is it protectable? And then you have to look at the different kinds of protection that are out there. So you have patent, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. You have copyright, I love copyright. Copyright's great for computer programs. It's great for uh, presentations. It's great for a lot of things where you're trying to set out ownership. If you're going to do a company, something like that, you need to think about trademarks. And if you do that, you've got to think about the fact that you've got social media, that you've got domain names, and all of these things you're going to tie together. You're going to want to do a search, not only be sure that it's not already taken by somebody, Google it, see what's associated with that name. Sometimes you're surprised, um, unpleasantly surprised uh, with it being associated with something you don't like. So you want to look at a lot of those things before you pick a name. My, my little computer people doing these graphs have a name for what they've done. And I said, did you look at trademarking? Did you do a search? Have you got a domain name? And they said, no, but we think we're going to do a company, so we'll go do that. I said, great, and they could do those things. I gave them the databases. It's easy to do. Trade secrets, again, you're in Atlanta. Everybody knows the most valuable trade secret out there is Coca-Cola secret formula. Unlimited in time, criminal and civil penalties, fabulous for databases. And then we have contracts. You know, these are all the different kinds of contracts. So let's go to the next slide. Is What is a patent? Patents are an interesting thing because they are considered an asset. They're what's called an intangible right. It is a legal right. It's just like having a title to a piece of property or your car, except that you can't see it or feel it. It's used to exclude people. You don't need a patent to market something. This is probably the most common question I get when I'm talking with people that want to form a company. Well, don't we have to file so we can do this? No, you don't. If you sell, offer to sell or disclose before you file, you may lose your patent rights, but you don't have to have this in order to file. Um, I just had a rather uh, interesting experience this week working with one of my little startups where they're trying to, to raise money and they're meeting with investors. And the investor said, why did you file this fast track patent application? It's so early stage. And I said, because they're on sale. Unusual to see something that within a few months of forming the company and filing a provisional, they have a product on sale. It will be modified, but they need a patent now. Patents exclude your competitors, and it's a very crowded field they're in. So when you look at this, you, you not only have to look at, can I file a patent? Can I get a patent? You have to look at whether others can stop me. You never want to invest a huge amount of money in something without making sure that you're not dead in the water before you ever start. 
Next. When you are looking at patentability, there are five basic requirements. You have to have patentable subject matter. We just talked about some of these things. Can be a device, composition, formulation, process of making, process of using, um, not algorithms, not humans and parts thereof, not surgical methods that don't have a novel device or part. Um, you can patent naturally occurring materials that have been isolated and modified, whether it's because you purified them to remove things that are in them that are, are toxic, uh, you altered the form, say, from an amorphous to a crystalline structure. These kinds of things can be used to modify things that would not normally be patentable to, to make them patentable. They have to be novel. In other words, nobody can have disclosed it orally in writing uh, or um, electronically. Uh, you know, there's a there's a, a the famous story about the laser patents being killed because a graduate student talked to somebody at a conference. Non-confidential disclosure. They hadn't filed till after the conference. Uh, they killed the patent. A lot of money there. Next. So when you're looking at what's patentable, it has to be novel. It can't be obvious. But just because something may seem to be obvious at the time doesn't mean it is. It's not a question of obvious to try. It's a question of would somebody skilled in the art be led to do this in the way that you're doing and claiming with a reasonable expectation of success. Let me give you an example that's kind of a combination of novel and not obvious. Back when I very first got into to doing patents, I was at in Boston, and I worked with, um, at that time, a very young professor by the name of Bob Langer, who was thinking about how you take and make biodegradable drug delivery devices. And the first group of polymers he was looking at were polyanhydrides. Polyanhydrides were not novel polymers, per se. They'd been developed back in the 1950s, believe it or not, to make clothing. They said, oh, they're polyesters. They'd be great. The problem is they're biodegradable, so when you wash the clothes, they disintegrate. Uh, not not a great way to make clothes. So he said, well, these would be perfect for doing drug delivery. So I got these cases transferred to me that had been rejected as either lacking novelty or obvious over that prayer relating to making clothes. And examiner kept rejecting it, saying intended use doesn't impart patentability. So I went back to him and said, well, can you just take the same polymers that you make clothes out of and use them for drug delivery? And they said, of course not. You have to recrystallize them. You have to remove impurities that are toxic. So when we defined it that way, those patents all issued and they did go on to, to actually form a company and uh, they had one product that's still being used in treatment of, of brain tumors, this the gliadel. One of the biggest problems we have though with startups and early stage technology is that when you're looking at technology today, it's often something that you might have been done in a lab. It's very early stage. It's not what you're actually going to sell, particularly if you're thinking not just of licensing, but doing a company. It's really important to think about where you're going to be five, 10 years from now, because that's likely when you're going to identify those products. So the problem there, and if we go to the next slide, is how to balance with what you know at the time you're filing with where you might be in five to 10 years. You can't take an application, you can file new applications, but you can't modify your existing ones. So what we do is something called constructive reduction of practice. We try to predict the future. It's really important. The next slide talks about some of the problems with predicting the future in the patent world, because we have to enable that what you're doing, as well as provide a clear and definite written description of it. In Europe these days, they are eviscerating patent protection because they're saying if it's not explicitly disclosed in that application, they won't let you get claims to it. It's become a big problem. It's part of the general anti-patent environment. It's just a political thing, they, particularly in the drug field, where they think that drugs are cheaper if they're not patented, which might be true, but you also don't have innovation. And the U.S. is still the leader in innovation, particularly in the medical field, because people can 
get reimbursed for the hundreds of millions of dollars it takes to get a product actually into the market. Next. So trade secrets are still a great way to go. You don't have to patent it. You don't have to spend any money on it. You just have to keep it secret. A lot of stuff that's done these days is based on analysis of data and predicting and taking computer programs to allow you to analyze a sample, um, analyze a process, improve it, make something better, create value. These are best kept as trade secrets, unlimited in term, you just keep them secret and uh, they have significant value. Next, um, copyright, again, we briefly mentioned this earlier. Every time you do a presentation, market copyright, you do a business plan, market copyright, um, your posters and so forth. Market copyright, you don't have to register it. You can go to copyright.gov if you want, download forms and register, but everything from photographs and diagrams to presentations, you can establish that it is yours and somebody cannot copy it and use it. Next, contractual rights. Of course, these are the ones you already have employment agreements with the university. They get ownership of something you develop within the term of your agreement. Uh, there are non-compete agreements. Um, this is, I was telling a story earlier, my, my son who works for company building wind and solar farms actually has a non-compete agreement that they put with their bonus agreement. And he apparently is the only one who actually read this agreement, called me up and says, isn't this a non-compete if I take the bonus? And I said, well, yes, it is. <laughs> so he wouldn't sign it till they agreed um, to take that out. So it was just kind of interesting. Uh, confidential disclosure agreements, this is how you get around the public disclosure. If you're gonna meet with people, be sure you have one. It establishes they're not supposed to copy it. If you talk with investors, potential business people, a lot of them won't sign a confidential or non-disclosure agreement. So you want to make sure not to give them something confidential and anything you give, give it as a non-editable, non-copyable document where you put like a watermark on it, proprietary, confidential. Um, materials transfer agreement, these are all institutional agreements. Uh, allowing you to transfer stuff without giving up ownership or what may be derived. And of course, there are always license and option agreements um, and partnership agreements for distribution, sell, development of property, and so forth. Okay, next slide. This is kind of my next flow chart here, how to market. So, and this is something your TLO does all the time. And so I'm not gonna, I'm not speaking to them as my audience here, because they know all of this. But when they look at something, the first thing they'll look at is, is it a product, is it a platform? Products may be something that you say, ah, we do need to do further development, see if there's value, see if you have something that might be marketable, what kind of value. Uh, you might say it's pretty well developed and license it, option it. Um, an option is where somebody gets an agreement to look at something and consider buying it. Um, a license is a definitive agreement to actually develop and market that, that product. Uh, you may want to partner it. And I'm going to give some specific examples in a minute of, of how some of these things are, are done. And a lot of times you're going to take and develop that early stage technology where you may have an existing product, you want to identify it, test it. You may want to say, is this potential product? What kind of market are we looking at? What kind of valuation on that market? Um, products can have a very high valuation, even if it's only one product. But if you're trying to form a company, you generally, and this is not exclusively, but generally need something that's more platform. The reason for that, and I'm going to define these terms in just a second, the reason for that is because a platform is broader, it has more options, it allows you to start a company where you may have a proposed immediate product and more in your pipeline, so that if one fails, you have spread the risk of that failure so that one of the other products might work, particularly a big deal in drugs where your chance of failure is high. Um, one of the companies we work with out of a university just took a product all the way through into phase two to find out that they didn't meet those goals. They've gone back to the pipeline. They're looking at that to see what to do. That's what companies do to try to salvage 
something that you hope didn't happen but could. Most startup companies have investors who want a short-term exit. Within three to five years, they want out of that company by sale or merger into another company. That's usually their goal. Sometimes they get started in one area of technology. They decide that the market's not good enough. There are too many problems with the product. And they may go to further development. They may go license some other technology where they can, again, hedge the bet, spread the risk in order to take and maximize return. Next. I think for most universities, the two most common ways to commercialize their technology is either to license to a company to develop one or more products. You'll have perhaps sponsored research agreements. You'll have license fees. You'll have um, milestone payments when certain guideline deadlines are met. And you'll eventually have royalties if there's a sale. If it's to a company, they will also oftentimes take equity in the company. And then when your investors cash out, most of the universities cash out as well. The downside of that is when everybody cashes out, the risk of the technology not being able to go forward, if you don't have the right business people, if you don't have enough investment, is, is high. And if I were to look at the highest failure rate on most of these startups, this is where I see it is that the investors came in, they took out too much, they didn't leave enough for the company to go forward with its proposed projects, and they didn't have the business people that were experienced enough and strong enough to anticipate this. Uh, it's a big, big problem. You have to have the right people with companies or you will not succeed, even if you start out with enough investment, a big market share, a great product. You have to constantly be convincing investors that you have a platform of technology where they can share the risk, they can maximize return and get out of it in time. Next. Market and market shares determine standard business analysis. I mean, this is not IP law. This is plain old fashioned business people. Some, it's interesting, some of the universities now have partnered with business schools to do this. They take business students and they, graduate students, and they have them do the business plans and then they have them create analysis of the market and where the product will go. The market can change over time. Um, somebody may come up with a much better idea than you. That's the end of your market. Uh, your product may not turn out to be the same. You're using intellectual property to exclude competition. So a big point there is if you're going to have something like a patent, again, predict the future. Predict not just where you may go, but where your competitors may go. Make sure you don't have an easy walk around. When I talk with investors who are doing due diligence, particularly on startups, sometimes on licenses, one of the first questions they always ask is, can we exclude competitors? Can competitors exclude us from marketing? It's a big deal. Next. So I promised to tell you what platform IP was. And it was interesting because I Googled this term thinking, everybody knows what platform is. The answer was no, they don't. Um, it apparently has meanings completely different from how it's used when we talk about platform IP. This is generally viewed as a broad category of maybe novel materials, formulations, devices, methods of making, using, or all of the above that covers not just a single product or two or three, but of covering a group of potential products and where you generally has the benefit that it allows for a lot further development. Next. Platform technologies allow for the intentional and repeatable generation of multiple products or platform technologies. Go to any website for, for example, I'll just use a drug company. If you go to their website, one of the first things you'll see is pipeline. And you'll see products and they tell you where they're going to go with it and where their plans are long term. They usually have a short term product. Uh, an intermediate term product and others down the road, which they may or may not ever get to based on how things go. 
The advantages of platform technology is it allows you to, to spread the risk of failure. It allows you to do a better job of predicting and covering where you may go with this technology. And it gives you more flexibility. Uh, a lot of times a company will license out some of those potential products or partner them with somebody else. They'll say, okay, we're gonna pick this disease indication, these drugs, and we're gonna license out these other indications to somebody that's already in that field. It, that allows them to maximize their resources and opportunities. The downsides are, is that when you start patenting platform technology and you start discussing it, you're creating your own prior art. And so it's a problem to cover those later developments. You'll generally go back more with product specific IP later on and hope that you cover it. But it's always a consideration that you have to take into account in, in looking at is it platform, is it product, and how we want to present it. Next, a really good example of platform technology, and it's in the news a lot right now, is the mRNA vaccines for COVID-19. And look at what Moderna has done with them. They have a platform which was is broad. It's got the mRNA that's encoding proteins for particular virus, that's the target. So you're not infecting somebody with an attenuated virus. You're actually just a little piece of it, so it's safer. They had to develop specialized carriers for that mRNA. They had to, um, and that's a, a poly, ethylene glycol lipid mixture in most cases. That took a lot of optimization. They had to figure out the amounts, um, how it would be administered, the, so the time and scheduling of administration, packaging, distribution, storage. Each one of those things is separately patentable. And that knowledge is applicable to vaccines for many other indications, certainly not just COVID-19. And in fact, if you look at when they filed their platform patent application, it was filed back in 2011, prior to 2010, very early. They were looking at a lot of other viruses, including things like Zika, which, um, and, and influenza and other viruses that, and SARS and MERS, things that were in the news with our last pandemics. Uh, so they knew at the time it was platform. They used it to form this company and develop this technology. Next, this is, um, I think, a good example of, if you look at what they're doing, they have 20 different programs going on using this technology. They have many, many applications they've filed throughout the world. They're beginning to get patents on their COVID-19 products. They have regulatory approval, another way to take and exclude competition. And so, They've taken platform, combined it with lots of product specific development in order to take and form the basis of the company, again, spreading risk, increasing return. And if you look at their current valuation, you can see this is definitely an example of a home run. Next slide. Product specific IP is different. It's usually easier to enable it. It's easier to reduce to practice. Um, it may be more patentable in a way because there's going to be less prior art in most cases. It's easier to define your market because, again, lower risk is more narrow, more specific. But that um, the, the market can be huge. And even if I take the example of um, COVID again, let's go to the next slide. This is a really good example of a product specific IP, it came out of platform technology. Just go to the next slide for one second and I'm gonna back up. Okay, this one. So you can see Emory file on a lot of different chemical compounds, these N4 hydroxycytidine derivatives for a lot of different applications, primarily as antivirals. Now, if you'll go back to the previous slide. Or maybe I not. don't know how to do that, Vitria. Okay. <laughs> oh, sorry. Not a problem. Okay. So if we look at the, the broad general platform application, the one that's most relevant to what I'm discussing today is the fact that they discovered that there was an oral antiviral called Milnuprevir. Uh, there is a their patent specific technology on this for treating COVID-19. It's in the news a lot right now. 
So this was licensed to a startup company called Ridgeback Biotherapeutics, two founders. They put in about $300, $350 million, I think, to develop this drug. And then they partnered it with Merck to do the additional clinical trials. Big deal because clinical trials cost literally hundreds of millions of dollars. And particularly when you're trying to fast track them, you have the advantage of a large company with a track record for making these kinds of compounds, manufacturing, distributing them, regulatory agencies to getting them approved and dealing with the government and entering into government supply contracts. So it's interesting here because the startup company here was more used as a conduit for getting access to another partner and providing the funding to translate it from the early development into a real product. This is a particularly interesting and timely topic showing the potential downfalls of drugs in our anti-patent environment right now because there was so much government funding used in the development of these compounds, hundreds of millions of dollars actually, which is a lot, um, that we have the issue of whether we have the Bayer-Doyle rights. For those of you who filed, those of you who work with, with government um, contracts, got funding, this is what's called march-in rights. This is where the government technically has the right to a royalty-free license to the technology to make and use it. I can assure you in every one of these situations, it's the first question investors ask when you say we have government funding. So what's gonna stop the government from coming in and just taking it? The answer is to date, it's they've never exercised those rights. The biggest challenges under these laws came into play back when HIV was a massive pandemic People were dying and they came up with AZT, the first really important anti-AIDS drug. And we had GlaxoSmithKline that had identified it, developed it, tested it. The governor, governor, US government wanted to take and see if they could give rights to generic drug companies. This is back at the beginning of the, the really big generic drug industry. They had a company that asked to license these rights to make AZT under Bayerdahl. It was litigated and they said that it was only applicable if the entity that had the patents did not have the resources to make and sell it into the marketplace and meet the need. The government is not in the business of making and distributing drugs. I think that was unequivocally demonstrated last year when we had the situation with the respirators, the government. They, they truly didn't know how to, to do this very well. So most of my talk here, um, I, I can give some more uh, examples and things, uh, but I thought perhaps I should go ahead and just turn this over to questions. Great, thank you. Um, thank you, Patria. We do have uh, several questions in the chat, and I will go in order. Um, the first question uh, from uh, Raja Puma is, what is a non-compete agreement? Okay. Actually, Christie's just reminded me, I have two more slides I should run through before I do that, and I apologize oh. profusely, in which I summarize this whole thing, and then I will go to what is a non-compete. <laughs> okay. Um, the summary is that valuation of technology is dependent on the associated IP. You can use IP to package and present the technology. Identify the market. We call that, out of the European world, the problem to be solved as well as the technology i.e. the solution to the problem, and it can be used to delineate and expand the scope of the technology. So what do I mean by that? Um, I mean that you can, and, and again, I see this a lot when, when I'm meeting with people, they have that specific idea. They don't do a good job of selling the story. And so when you have that patent application, you can use it to say, 
This is the what is it and who cares. This is what others have done. We're different because. This is valuable because. There's this longstanding problem, hasn't been met, we can meet it. It is a selling document. It's important to always, whether you're talking with investors or licensees or the patent office, to be able to package and present that technology in a way that allows the other side to focus on what is it, who cares, what's the value, why should I invest, why should I license, where do I go with this? So with that, I can now tell you what a non-compete agreement is. Um, non Employment agreements as a whole often have several provisions. They have confidentiality provisions, they have assignment provisions that say, you make it on our time, our money, we own it. And a non-compete says, if you get access to trade secrets, proprietary information, our technology, it could be a vendor list, it could be reagents, it could be specific conditions at which you make something, it could be um, how to set up a room to make it the most efficient way, the order of the equipment and manufacturing. These have value that have been developed by the company. They don't allow you to go to another company and use that information for the benefit of the other company. If you, I'm gonna go back to a Coca-Cola example and their, their secret formulas. Um, it may be something as simple as what temperature you run a manufacturing process at. But if you take that information and go to a competitor, they can stop you. If it's not kept secret, you can't stop them. There's a, a famous case where people were making enantiomers of a chemical compound and they did this in a clean room and they were crystallizing this new form of a known compound and they had a bunch of Japanese visitors wearing the lab coats and the little hoods and, and the booties and they walked through this room and some of the crystal miraculously got into the pocket of somebody's clothing. They took it back to their company. They determined what that form was and they and how to make it. And the court said, you gave up your trade secret rights by letting somebody walk through that room. If they could have shown that they were only allowed access through a, a public region and that they got that information from an employer, employee, they could have stopped whoever took that information on the grounds that it was basically stolen information and they could have penalized the employee for giving away a trade secret, in essence, engaging in competition with their employer. Does that help? Maybe I can go to chat here. Ah, this will help, okay. Yeah, so uh, that, that's that's helpful. Um, so the next question we have here uh, is, this is Proven Ready. Uh, if algorithms are not patentable, then how are machine learning and AI uh, protected since these are algorithms? Okay, if you structure your algorithm and learning as methods they and if you partner them and or partner them with novel devices they're patentable if you look at the most hotly litigated area of intellectual property right now you just identified it um, i actually was looking at something where they were saying what what are the most difficult areas to get patents in from the U.S. Patent Office right now, and what are the ones most likely to be litigated? You just this is the area. It's a very very difficult area to get patents in. However, you can copyright, and you can protect as trade secrets. So and you can protect databases and learning again as trade secrets. Um, proprietary information that's derived from these things. And it's difficult. You know, it's very, very difficult to protect with patents. You have to use some of the other mechanisms, copyright, trade secret, um, to protect them in a meaningful way. What we always do is package these things. It's, it's almost never one thing. 
you know, if you look at, and I didn't talk much about trademarks, but I love trademarks. You know, what did Apple do? First off, they came up with a trademark that has nothing to do with computers and phones, and they built a whole com massive company out of it. Google kind of did the same thing. A lot of their stuff is AI. A lot of it is algorithm-based. And if you look at, for example, just design patents, uh, Steve Jobs had more design patents than almost anyone else has ever had based on just using that as an aspect to protect things. Package everything. You patent what you can. You use trade secrets. You use trademark. You use copyright. You use um, agreements that restrict people from talking. You do like they've done with their current iPhones and seal them so you can't get in them. These are the kind of things people do. Well, the next question that we have from Doug Britton is is very much related. You know, he's asking, do you have any insight on general categories of technologies that should pursue the copyright trade secret instead of a pathway, instead of a patent? Yes. Um, anything that can't be reverse engineered can be kept as a trade secret. If it can be reverse engineered and you're going to put a product in the marketplace, trade secrets will not protect you. Okay, that's the first point. Anything that changes over time rapidly should be considered being kept as a trade secret. And what you do on a lot of computer programs is, and you've seen these copyright notices with the C and the year and the copyright owner, and a lot of them will say, you know, 2018 to 2021, because they're copywriting, copywriting, and copywriting each version. It's a very powerful way. Copyrights recognized throughout the world. There are rights. Um, you know, if you look at the movie industry, they protect almost everything using primarily copyright. So it's a very effective way to, to protect things. If it can be reverse engineered, you cannot use trade secrets, but you may be able to use copyright because copyright in its essence typically means it arises upon creation and it lasts for a very, very long time. The lifetime of the author plus 75 years. Very, very long term. Trade secrets last as long as you can keep them secret. If somebody discovers it, your rights are lost. That's the downside to trade secret. But I like trade secrets in part because they're also, you can get, because they're criminal as well as civil penalties, you can use that to um, enforce your rights and it isn't going to require the owner to have to go spend millions of dollars in litigation. Uh, this is a question from uh, Lena Gamboa. Can trade secrets be patented by someone else who figures nope. it out? No. Remember, the, a basic, and, and I didn't put this in my slide, but a really basic aspect of a patent is you have to declare you are the inventor, or we are the inventors. If you did not conceive and reduce to practice that which you are claiming, you are not entitled to a patent. If you steal, um, nicer word, if you discover somebody else's technology and try to patent it, your patent would be invalid. You did not invent it. Ah, very interesting. Um, Patria, uh, another question from Doug Britton. What percentage of technologies are commercialized through licensing to existing industry versus startup? Are you able to answer that question? It varies a huge amount. Um, I do a lot of work with universities, and I would say most technology is not licensed, period. Yeah. I don't know percentages. It varies. And tech both in terms of the technical field as well as the licensing offices. Um, I've worked with MIT since the 80s. They've turned into an extraordinary machine with access where everybody comes to them to license. Most universities don't have that. Um, Yale has really cranked up in terms of doing startups and they've invested in a lot of startups and so they've got more doing it. Johns Hopkins, another group, I, a university I work with, they they have significantly increased what they're licensing. They're using primarily their professors as the means to form those startups and for licensing contacts. Everybody has a different way of licensing. Success and failure is turn turns a great deal on what is the technology, what is the market. 
the more market you have, the more valuable the market, the more likelihood of licensing. It's the first question you have to answer. What is it and is it marketable? If it doesn't have value, there is no point in having a patent because there is no competition. Nobody wants it. Nobody pays for it. Why would you bother with a patent? You wouldn't. You know, and and licensing is getting access to the patent rights, maybe the trade secrets, copyright know-how, in order to take and sell something and exclude competition. I just met with the most wonderful inventors, they've got a, a company. We have spent years getting patents allowed on uh, a stem cell technology. Very, very difficult patents to get. And so, you know, and so the patents are running. You have 20 years from your earliest filing date and they've lost half their patent term getting them. So I said to him, I said, okay, it's time we take and expand the patent rights here. It's, it's time to say, okay, so what new things can we file on? And there are new things because they've learned a lot in that intervening time period, but they also spent a lot of time just validating it. And that was their first response is, well, we have scientific validation. I said, I don't care. You know, we can sell. We need to file on what you're going to sell. What is that? And to make a long story short, I never got an answer because they had never focused on now that we have it, what are we going to do with it? Are so you going to sell services? Are you going to sell kits to, so other people can do this? How would you enforce it? It's a question that should have been asked early on so that they knew what that market was and could figure out how to create a business strategy to go with it. In this particular case, as in many university technologies, there were a lot of other considerations going on, political considerations, um, it being the culmination of, of years of research, many other things. And so sometimes those may be the purpose for filing patents. But if you're talking about a business, if you're talking about get, receiving a return on that investment, you've got to think about market. What are you going to market? What is it worth? What is the market? What is the market share? If you're going to be one of 30, it's very hard to have the same valuation. It doesn't matter if it's a $100 million market. If you're one of 30, it's a much smaller market. And then you have to realistically say, but if they're already in the marketplace, how do I take away market share from somebody who's already there? We talked earlier about Impossible uh, Burger. And food alternatives are very big right now. Lots and lots of startups, particularly on the West Coast for these alternatives. So for companies trying to get in to compete with the Impossible Burger, how do they take that market share where? What is the story they have that says, this is what makes us different? I'm working with a small company there where what they're doing is, I don't know that their product's better, I have no idea, but they certainly have a cheaper way to make it. So their margin, profit margin, is gonna be higher because the way to make it is cheaper. So that means that they can go in the marketplace and sell for less money, make the same profit, and that will allow them into the market. It will allow them to compete with somebody who's already there. It's how you build market share. This is common business practice. It has nothing to do with IP. So those are the kind of things we think about. Okay, sorry, go ahead. Um, uh, Doug has another question. Um, is the priority date for IP established by the filing of a provisional patent? And how long can you delay after filing the provisional before you need to file the patent? The first is the first answer is yes, a priority date for whatever is disclosed that meets the requirements for enablement and written description in your priority document is given that date against subsequent priority, subsequent art, subsequent people who publish on it. If it's not in there and you add it over the period of one year from your first filing date that you have to convert to a PCT for international rights or US utility application, you will not get benefit of that earlier date. It's why it's a disaster to do the so-called cover sheet provisionals. You will not get benefit of priority um, 
the European Patent Office is doing a slash and burn on these cases now. They are denying priority, denying priority, denying priority to anything like that. If you come in later and put in a claim to a genus or a family and you didn't define the genus of the family in the provisional, you will not get benefit. I tell most of my startup groups, I said, file your provisional, come back in three months, maximum six months, reassess everything in new, refile. You have no limit on the number of provisionals to which you can claim priority. Very important in competitive fields, particularly since applications are not published till 18 months after the first priority date. So if you're within 18 months of when you think a group, for example, disclosed, they may have presented something, they may or may not have filed on it, you won't know for 18 months. So you have to assume they filed. So you know? I, can I just ask the question? So um, you let's say you filed a provisional and that sets the priority date and you've got a year from then from that time to then convert it to a non-provisional. During that year, can you revise the provisional application or you have that's not allowed? Yes, absolutely, and, and you really should. I mean, first you should try to take and, and put more into that first one. I mean, you definitely wanna take from the specific example and expand and build it out. That's really, really important. That's what we call constructive reduction to practice. Predict where you're gonna go with it, not where you are today. So do you then, have to file another provisional or you can take the original and add on to it? Oh, I just tell people take the original and just add. Yeah. Okay. Edit, edit the original. I mean, and for that matter, with provisionals being so cheap to file, this is easy. We have an application format we use and we just tell people to plug in. And then we edit it and we put in our questions so people can build it out. And then they can come back and, you know, and it depends what their research is doing and what and if they're talking to potential partners. Oh, very, very important. <laughs> it is the 800 pound gorilla problem when people talk to big players, whether it's investors, big pharma, big company, it doesn't matter. You don't have any leverage. You can't afford to fight them and they know it. You can have a signed non-disclosure agreement. It isn't gonna stop them from just knocking you aside and taking it if they think they can. I mean, I've seen it over and over. So what I tell people to do is use your provisional for a completely separate purpose, which is to prove ownership. Take that provisional and update it before you have those regularly scheduled meetings to discuss things, refile it. So you have proof these were your ideas, you have ownership before you meet with them because after you meet with them, and I, again, I've seen it over and over, all of a sudden, they're co-inventors and they co-own it. And your value just was cut in half. Very important. Use it as a defense mechanism because rights go to first to file in the U.S. and throughout the world now. Thanks. So you file first. They can't claim it later. So Patria, can patent life be extended with modification or variation of the original IP while the patent is alive? I see a lot of families or multiple patents on the same or similar IP. It's a really complicated question. I'm gonna to try to make it a little more simple. There are mechanisms in almost every country in the world that while an application is pending, you can file the, refile the same application as a new application. It will have the same priority date. You can claim other subject matter that's disclosed in that application. It's used a lot when you've got your core patents that are covering what you're doing and you become aware of what a competitor may be doing and you wanna to try to get claims to stop your competitor. It's not something you're doing but you wanna stop them and use your patents to do it. So that's commonly done. Uh, sometimes you have, in the US it's called a restriction requirement, sometimes in Europe it's called lack of unity, where they say you have more than one invention. Patents throughout the world say you can only have one invention per patent. In the US it's carried to an extreme. You generally have compositions or method of making or method of using. Um, in Europe and most of Asia, they tend to combine but rules are different different on a country country basis. If they've made you pick certain claims to one technology, you can use those 
additional filings of the same application to cover those non-elected claims and, and pursue patents on that. There is something called the continuation in part. It's a US only. Um, we really, really don't recommend them. They, they just, they were great at one point in time, they aren't. Um, they almost invariably preclude getting corresponding foreign protection because you're admitting that the new application has priority to the original one, which is now available as priority against you outside the US. So it's a problem. People misunderstand them in the US. They think, oh, I can add to it, call it a continuation in part and get benefit of my original priority date. The answer is no, you don't. You only get benefit of priority for what was disclosed in the original application. So continuation parts are just a bad idea across the board in almost all cases. There are exceptions, but as a general rule, don't do them. What we do to extend patent life is I just mentioned the folks who have this method to, to make stem cells. So their patent term is running because things have been going on now for 10 years. So what I told them to do is, okay, so you've come up with modifications of your process. So if you're gonna sell kits, they're going to have a composition of those kits that are not in the original applications. So we can file a brand new application in 2021 defining those new compositions. If we do it as a provisional, we will get, we have one year to convert and then the patent term will be 20 years from that conversion date in 2022. So now we're looking at 2042 for the patent rights to expire instead of 2032. It's a big deal. And that's how typically people extend patent term. There is minor patent term extension when the patent office delays in issuing a patent. There are, unless you've got a terminal disclaimer, which is a separate issue. Um, and there are some extensions available for delay on drugs when they're novel compositions or new indications where you can get an extension. Um, they aren't typically that long. They're rare. There's a very short timeline. They are available, but that's a specialized field. The most common way to get additional patent terms to do what I just described, file new applications to new developments as a brand new separate application which then gives you additional patent term five, 10, 15 years sometimes. Well, Patria, these are, this is really, these are some great questions. I think they've really sparked some really wonderful conversations. Um, we have, um, maybe you can, we have another software question here. And I think this is something that's very uh, relevant to a lot of people at Georgia Tech. Um, and it says, so we are making new software using other software as building blocks cannot be patented. The new part can, um, the, again, okay, I'm gonna rephrase this. Everything is built on something else. It doesn't matter whether it's software, it doesn't matter if it's chemistry, it doesn't matter if it's fake meat. Everything is built on other things. So the fact that you use somebody else's is not, does not preclude protecting something. The question is what can you protect? So. If they have copyrighted the other software, and they probably have because everybody that sells software copyrights it. So you can't use that without a license from the copyright owner. If you So if you want to sell the copyright that includes their copyrighted software, you have to have a license to it. If you are trying to patent it, where what you're doing is basically patenting the method and not the copyrighted software per se, yes, you can patent that to the extent that you can patent the method. And I am not a software expert. There are people who have probably figured out very clever ways to do this better than I'm aware of. It's a very, very specialized field. It's just also a field that's in a state of flux. Um, and it might change. Right now, it's very difficult to patent software. And All right. Well, um, Patria, we are um, we up, we're a little bit past uh, 12 noon now. I just want to uh, thank you very much for this really informative seminar and even more informative, um, you know, question and answer session. So thank you so much. 
I'd like to thank all of our uh, folks that uh, have asked questions and have been involved. And we are now um, going to go over to the um, office hours for those people who registered. So I um, just want to thank everybody. Um, very good, very, very good presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you.